if there's one thing that's missing in the lives of many Christians, it's doing something. But there's a lot of Christians out there who are living their life as a Christian with nothing to really do with it. What sets our church apart from many others, not all, but many, is that we will give you something to do with your Christianity. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, and Mike already read us the text, so we'll come back through and comb it apart a little bit. Paul writing to Timothy, some of the last words that Paul would ever speak, uh, so, to, so to speak, um, the last words that he's known for writing here, he says in the last chapter of that final letter, I charge you therefore... <coughs> He is charging Timothy something great here. Paul is making this charge that we've read of in light of what he has just said to Timothy, the stuff that we covered last week. There are some things that he says that leads him up to making this charge that we are going to be dealing with this morning. And so um, I want to go back a little bit into what we went through last week so that we can remind ourselves, like Paul was, of all the things that led up to this thing in Timothy's life that he was being charged with fulfilling. A lot of it was, a lot of things were leading up to that. First of all, in verse 10 of chapter 3, Paul is reminding Timothy that, hey, Timothy, you've invested the last 20 years of your life being prepared for a mission. It's essentially what he's getting at in verses 10 and 11. Paul says, you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, perse persecutions, afflictions. And he has followed Paul for the last two decades, carefully observing everything that Paul does and making adjustments along the way. He's adopted Paul's doctrine. He's adopted Paul's lifestyle. He's committed and invested everything about himself into this mission. Paul goes on to remind Timothy in verse 12 that he has and will pay the price for that mission, just like every Christian will. Anyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ will suffer persecution. Paul says, you've already made investment into this, you've already paid the price, and you'll continue to pay the price for this mission. In verse 13, Paul reminds him that false teachers and liars threaten to destroy his mission. He says, evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there are threats to this mission. In verses 14 and 15, Paul reminds Timothy that others before him have already worked to prepare him for the mission. There have been people in his life, Paul being one of them, who have been investing in Timothy so that Timothy can go and fulfill what God has ordained him to do. His mother is another, his grandmother also, preparing Timothy since his youth for the work that lies ahead. In verses 16 and 17, closing out chapter 3, Paul reminds Timothy that the scriptures alone are the very foundation and future of that mission. So what exactly is that mission? Well, in today's text, Paul says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word. What's the mission? Timothy's mission is to preach. To preach the Bible. And Paul is being very emphatic here. In fact, he couldn't be more straightforward about this. He says in verse 1, when he says, I charge you, therefore, the word charge is a very uh, specific and clear command, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Paul couldn't be any more straightforward than this. Timothy... Everything in your life since you were born has been leading up to this very thing, this calling, this mission. It's to preach. Don't neglect it. 
He says, might I remind you that you do this before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's interesting that Paul starts everything before he even makes the command. He reminds Timothy that every Sunday that he gets up as the lead preaching pastor of the church at Ephesus to dispense God's truth that the people that are visible are not the only ones in the audience. He says, God is there and Jesus Christ is there. And I'm telling you, preach rightly because they're taking note. God's watching. God's listening. It's a fact that um, I live with as I teach, that I understand very well that God is uh, observing all of this and will one day judge me. He'll judge me according to what I've said. Either I've done it right or I've done it wrong. And I hope and I pray and I try my best to do it right something a little unnerving about that and Paul means to unnerve Timothy a little bit about that. I charge you before God and before Jesus Christ who will judge you for everything you say, you'd better say it. God's watching, God's listening, and God's opinionated, isn't he? And it just seems that few pastors today actually care about that. And I don't think that that's a very wise thing to do, a very healthy approach to take to the ministry, to leave God's opinion out. Speaking personally, I, I have to wonder, and I don't know if I'm accurate in this, but I wonder if all pastors like me are tempted when they, when they speak publicly to do, to do so in such a way that they win the approval of the people they're speaking to. It's very tempting. Do you know that? Every time I get up here to speak, I wanna, I wanna, sometimes I just, I'm tempted to write jokes into my notes so that I can hopefully make you laugh and keep you engaged and win your favor. But that's not what I'm called to do. I'm not called to entertain. Timothy's not being called to entertain people. Timothy is being called to preach in such a way as to please the Lord in spite of what everybody else thinks. God is watching. Jesus is there. And I think that God's Approval should really be the motivating factor behind everything we say and do. Not just me. Everything you say, everything you do, should have God's pleasure and approval as its motivating force. You know what the Bible says? That if you're motivated by the approval of men, the approval of your audience, you lose the approval of God. You, you can't always have both. Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, he said, if I seek to please men, I'm no longer a servant of Christ. If I'm seeking to please people, I'm no longer even a servant of God. I can't serve God and seek to please people at the same time. And it's crucial that we become people as Christians who care more about what God thinks than what people think. And that's why Paul throws this line in there. He says, he will judge the living and the dead. Now, if Jesus is going to judge people that are alive and people that are not alive, that means he's going to judge everybody, and that's Paul's point. Timothy, you don't escape God's judgment just because you're a preacher. God's opinionated about you, too. Just because you rose up through the ranks and you found favor with an apostle and just because, you know, you're the leader of a church now and you got it all going on does not mean for one minute that you won't be judged by Jesus. And so he backs him into a corner, really corner where he's faced with the truth. Timothy's got nowhere to run. I better do this right. I have no choice. Well, how do we move forward from here? Paul says, well, if you want to do this and escape God's judgment, then preach the word. Preach. Preach. Just preach. I think it's interesting. I mean, as far as this text is concerned, this seems like the pastor's primary responsibility is to preach the Word faithfully. That's his greatest responsibility before God. Preach the Bible, first and foremost. Granted, there may be other duties in the minister's life, but those, whatever they are, come second to this. The only one here in this text that God seems to care about is that the pastor never fails to preach the Bible. That's his primary objective. Not to feed hungry mouths, not to vaccinate sick children, not to secure housing for the homeless. The pastor's primary responsibility in his ministry is not to do house calls or hospital visits. 
It's not to keep dinner dates or conduct business meetings. It's not to cast corporate vision, perform weddings or officiate at funerals. It's not to give the blessing before meals, administer the sacraments, baptize Christians or build the church. The primary duty of a pastor is not to be nice and non-offensive and smile a lot, though a lot of people might think that that is his primary responsibility. His primary responsibility isn't even to pray and study and save souls or make conversions. The pastorate may include many such activities, but all of them are absent from this text in order to make room for the one responsibility that really counts, and that's to preach the Bible. I mean, ultimately, if you don't have preaching, then all other work that the pastor does is in vain. You can't leave the truth out and hope that, you know, your charitable deeds is going to really serve the kingdom well. You might keep your dinner dates, but without preaching, you're nothing more than a hospitable cheapskate who's neglected to inform his guests of the truth. You might cast corporate vision, but in the end, you're building your own business rather than God's kingdom if you don't include preaching. If you're the lead primary teaching, preaching pastor, you may be nice and non-offensive and you might smile a lot, but you're not very nice if you're withholding the truth from your people. You're a stench in God's nostrils and you don't have much to smile about. And yet the world has been inundated with people who call themselves pastors, who take valuable space behind pulpits and dish out for people pabulum that benefits them nothing. Week after week after week, pithy little statements about religion and God and cute little stories about him and his family and funny little jokes and all kinds of things that might keep you awake for a while but it won't keep you alive for eternity. And so you've got men who are standing behind the pulpits too afraid to preach the truth. And if that's, if that's the case, that man is a liar and a thief. Anybody who fills the space of a pulpit and is too scared to preach what's true, he's a liar because he's trying to make his people think that the words he speaks will save when they don't, and he's a thief because he's stealing valuable space that should be occupied by men who are willing to proclaim the truth no matter how well it's received. It seems today that we have compromised so greatly that we don't even know what a true pastor is, and here Paul is shouting from the pages of Scripture, a real pastor is going to preach the truth all the time. And I would go beyond that and say Christians should be doing that. You may never get pulpit space, but should not the words that come out of your mouth be every bit as true as a pastor's? Should not we be confronting the world around us with God's truth just like a pastor is obligated to do so? Or is it only pastors that are supposed to talk about God? <laughs> Paul is insisting here that Timothy and all other preachers use the space behind a pulpit properly. And he says to do so, you need to include these three elements in your preaching. He says convince, rebuke, and exhort. Now the word convince uh, is actually reprove. And I say that because convince almost sounds too nice. Be convincing. When the word means to reprove, reprove actually means to expose guilt. Paul says expose their guilt, rebuke them. Rebuke means to chide them, make them feel bad. <laughs> I mean, this is terrible. Exhort. Now that's a good one. That means to encourage. But I want you guys to understand that those three elements that Paul says should be in every bit of preaching, and I don't want to make this into an equation, but just please notice that two-thirds of what Paul is requiring of Timothy's ministry is negative. Two-thirds is negative. Two-thirds is stuff that, boy, I'd rather avoid. Two-thirds is stuff that you'd rather avoid. Nobody comes to church going, expose my guilt and make me feel bad about it. That's what I need. Chide me some, pastor. Make me feel terrible. I think it's safer to say that truthful preaching, if it's, if it's godly and, and biblical, it's safer to say that, that that kind of preaching is going to be more negative tone than it will be positive in tone. And I'm not trying to justify my own approach to teaching the Bible because I know very well that sometimes it's uncomfortable. But I'm, I'm, 
my job is to teach the Bible, and this is what the Bible's teaching us this morning. So I, I'm not trying to use this as a self-serving means by which I can preach to offend. But preaching should be offensive. And it's not going to go over very well in a culture like ours that's like rabidly positive. You guys know how I feel about Minnesota nice. <sighs> I mean, it's terrible. You know, it's like you got a t-ball tournament and everybody goes home with a trophy, even the losers. You know, because everyone's a winner, really. Except we lost. But, you know, we're so afraid of offending anybody that we just got to be overtly positive, even though it's a lie. In this culture, exposing guilt is considered judgmental. And to chide anybody these days is to be a bully. So I guess if a pastor is going to be truthful and honest and God-fearing, then he's going to be seen as a judgmental bully. And so anybody who wants to fill that position ought to brace themselves because this culture is really coming hard against bullies, aren't they? Now, I'm not justifying all of the activities that bullies engage in, but as far as I'm concerned, if I'm preaching the Bible from the pulpit, I'm anything but a bully. I'm trying to save your soul from hell. That's helpful. Not bullying. Oh, it's not what you say, it's the way you say it. Sorry. It has to be said. I don't know how to say it nicely. Well, the style of preaching isn't just meant for the sinner. You know, the one off the street that really needs to hear the truth. This is meant for the, the church-going Christian. I mean, Paul is talking to Timothy. He's the pastor of a church that's been established years ago. It's up and running. I mean, this isn't even a church plant anymore. They're going. And so these are Christians. And Timothy, Paul is telling Timothy, chide them, rebuke them, expose their guilt. Don't leave encouragement out. Why? Well, because I think Christians need it just as much as the debauched sinner out there. The Christian certainly does have a need to hear this kind of preaching on a regular basis. Yes, and they need to be continually exhorted. That means to be encouraged, but not without consistent reproof and rebuke. The Christian needs it. If they didn't, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have prompted Paul to record this for Scripture. I think there's a lot of Christians that make the fatal mistake of believing that they can shield themselves from being from, from the, like the stinging words of hard preaching by making a few superficial changes to their lifestyle. And so somebody comes to church, and yeah, the, the, the preaching stings a little bit, so then they make a few adjustments, and then they start going, well, you know, I've been sober now for three years, so leave me alone about my sexual immorality. You know, I've been doing good in this area, so leave me alone about the rest. Sorry, not in this church. If there's issues, there are issues, and we want to take care of them because we want you to be healthy. We want you to be healthy because we love you. And so the preaching continues as according to God's Word. It's the, it's, the pastor has a funny job, and I'm, you know, Timothy being a pastor, he's, he's finding this out, but he's got a kind of a twofold ministry. And I'm stealing this, I've heard this line before, it's a great one and it's worthy of, of, of all acceptance. <laughs> a pastor's job is to comfort the afflicted. Is that not true? Somebody comes in here and the world has beaten them up. <coughs> Sin has had its, its run, its course in their life, and they are down, they are destitute, and they need help. And the pastor's job is to encourage the afflicted, to comfort them. So on the one hand, it's the, it's the pastor's job to comfort the afflicted, but on the other hand, it's the pastor's job to afflict the comfortable. And you got people coming to church for so long and, and becoming very comfortable in their, you know, assigned seat, wherever they sit, and, you know, they got the coffee in the morning and everything's going okay, and it's the pastor's job to keep them moving. Because that's the Bible's hope, is that you would continually move forward and progress. It's called sanctification. And so good Bible preaching is going to continually put the squeeze on you. And if it sees you laying down and getting comfortable, the shepherd of that church, through his words, is going to take the proverbial rod and start cracking the ankles of the sheep to get them moving again. Sorry. You know, I don't like hurting you. But sometimes words are in order that you might move forward 
not laying down and falling asleep where wolves can eat you while you slumber. There's a church radio commercial that me and Sarah heard, and it was years ago. I don't even know what church it was. But the radio commercial said, they're, they're advertising their church and the preaching, and the radio commercial said, always a positive message. And I knew it wasn't a JFB commercial. <laughs> <laughs> always a positive message. All that's doing is advertising itself as a place where people who hate the truth can go. You don't, think I'm, you don't think I'm honest about that? You don't think I'm accurate in that? Read verses 3 and 4. I mean, it becomes very clear that if people don't want the truth, they don't want the truth, truth they're going to have to find a church to go to that stops preaching the truth. Something a little more positive, something a little less abrasive. And so, there are churches out there for that. We have them in our own neighborhood. Guys, you've got to be suspicious of too much positive from the pulpit. Because we live in a culture that's suspicious of too much negative. We live in a culture that's suspicious of anything negative, anything offensive. We've got to be suspicious of too much positive, too much nice, too much humor, too much fluff. Correct Bible preaching from the pulpit should always squeeze you into sanctification because that's what the Bible's trying to do. And if the preaching isn't doing that, then it's not biblical. And sometimes the people in the church actually have a desire to be sanctified, to grow up, to mature. But there are other times when those same people want you to leave them alone. And that's why Paul says to Timothy, do it in season and out of season. Keep preaching, whether it's in vogue or in embarrassment. Climate's going to change, just like seasons change. We know that in Duluth, don't we? My own son was looking out the window yesterday saying, all the leaves are falling off the trees, it's really sad. And I'm like, you are my son. <laughs> so he cried a little bit in my office and then I put him to bed. But seasons change, guys, and just so in the church... Spiritual climate kind of ebbs and flows. And I'll also say that in you as an individual, there will be seasons. There will be seasons when you're passionate about growing up and maturing. And then there are going to be seasons when you want me to leave you alone. And you're going to come to church because you know you should and you got to be here and you know you've got faithful attendance. And then I'm going to say something that's going to catch you off guard and you're going to get mad at me. And then your heart's going to really deal with some bitterness and you're going to struggle in your head. And then hopefully the season will change again and you'll repent of that and you'll come back out of it and you'll be eager to grow again. And you're going to notice in yourself there will be seasons. And you're going to notice in the church that there will be seasons. And you will also notice in cultures there are seasons. Some seasons when the climate is cold and it prevents the spiritual growth and the fruit production that a pastor works so hard for. And in those seasons a pastor can get discouraged. That's why Paul says, even out of season, keep preaching. Don't let your discouragement stop you. Don't let the lack of fruit in your church stop you. Just keep going. And then there will be times when the climate is warm and it hastens the progress of the kingdom and you see the growth and the results and the pastor in those times can get distracted. The very opposite of discouraged. And it's easy for a pastor in those times to lose his head and the excitement of it all and begin making whatever adjustments he thinks necessary in order to keep the things moving in that direction. And in doing so, he ends up compromising the very thing that got him to that point in the first place, which was preaching the Bible. That's why Paul says even when the seasons and climates are conducive to gospel growth, keep preaching anyway. Don't stop preaching. In verse 3 and 4, Paul's warning Timothy that kind of, generally speaking, they're heading into a very long, dry season. A time in the world when the gospel is not very favorable overall. The reception of the truth of God's word is rather absent. He says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the people that go to Timothy's church. He's going, hey, Timothy, next Sunday, take a look around at everybody. There's going to come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
And it saddens me to think that there are people in this room who ultimately will prove themselves incapable of enduring sound doctrine. There may be some people right here, right now, that enjoy sound doctrine, but only for a while. People, what I've learned about some people is that they enjoy sound doctrine as long as it's reproving and rebuking somebody else in the room. And they love it. They love that style of teaching. I love it, Pastor. Preach it. Man, that was awesome. Rip it up, man. And people like that until suddenly they find themselves being the target of that reproof and that rebuke. And I've seen time and time again folks that won't endure that. They won't put up with it. Paul says, because they have itching ears, they're going to heap up for themselves teachers. Timothy, your people, some of them there, are going to turn away from you and start heaping up other people around themselves, other teachers, other pastors, who will tell them whatever they want to hear. Anybody but you. They will go to anybody but you. When they want to go to church, they ain't going to yours. When they want counseling, they ain't coming to you. They want to go to somebody's house for dinner or have somebody over, they ain't calling you. They don't want to hear what you have to say. Why? Because they're afraid of it. Why are they afraid of it? Because it hurts so bad. Why does it hurt so bad? It's not because of the pastor. It's because of the individual. The individual won't repent. When sin is repented of, There's no hurt to be had anymore. What hurts a person is when they hold on to sin in a church that preaches against it. I mean, if I'm trying to destroy sin by preaching the Bible, how do you think you're going to feel if you clutch the sin that's trying to be destroyed? You're going to get hurt. Because in this church, I'd like to think that we're pretty pretty aggressive about going after sin. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you're in trouble if you've got some sin issues in your life right now. <laughs> Let me just... There's a lot of grace here, too. We need to know what your issues are so we can help you work through them. But let me say this. If you have those same issues after three years and it's pretty apparent that you don't even want to get help for those issues, now you're going to get hurt. And if it isn't us and the preaching that hurts, it's going to be God. See how long you can go in life holding out, clutching one of your favorite sins. No one wins when they play tug of war with God. No one. And God in His love is attempting to take away from you the very things that hurt you so deeply. Let go. Let go of those things. Paul says, preach the word. Why? Because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Why should Timothy preach the word? Because there's going to come a time when people don't want him to. <laughs> preach the word. Why? Because they don't want you to. But shouldn't I stop? No. You should. I mean, that to me is so hard to wrap my mind around. Paul's saying, do what people don't want you to do. We live in a day and age where a lot of pastors think that it's their, their, their primary responsibility to find out what people like and don't like and then arrange their entire ministry around that. Paul says just the opposite. He says, don't change for them. Just keep preaching. And by the way, if that straightforward preaching is what brought people in in the first place, then isn't that what you should keep on doing to bring people in? I mean, some of you in this room, you're well aware of a very prominent pastor that is no longer pastoring. He's out on the West Coast. And it was ultimately his straightforward style of preaching that got him evicted from the pulpit. But what I find ironic is that he didn't change anywhere along the way, and it was his straightforward preaching that built up a mega church. if any of you know who I'm talking about. I, I just don't understand how that can happen. Keep preaching and let God take care of the rest. We live in a culture where very few people are going to, um, oh, I don't know, tolerate a church like this one simply because the truth is preached. And it's not that they won't visit this one. It's not that they won't get excited about this one. It's, it's just that they won't endure 
this one. And you look around the room and you go, well, geez, on a decent Sunday, we got 25 or 30 people here, and that's pretty, pretty nice. But um, if I had, if everybody that's ever come into this church as a visitor was still here today after seven years, we would not only have outgrown the basement, we would have outgrown the sanctuary. We would have to have closed circuit here and in a few other buildings locally. We'd be doing campus churches. And I've often wished that we would have kept a, a list of names. Everybody that visited, oh, what's your name? You know, and just, just to see. What, how long would that list be right now? And after seven years, the vast majority aren't here any longer. Why? Because we're all just a bunch of jerks. No, no, I'm, I'm saying that for, we're not. I mean, I think we're a pretty friendly group. Why aren't they here? Well, because the coffee is terrible. <laughs> Listen, you better not say that. We got pretty good coffee here. Well, then why aren't they here? Well, because it's just not a very cozy atmosphere. Kind of, just kind of, I don't like it down there. It's like, really? There's got to be some other reason why people aren't coming back. Well, it's because, true to Scripture, many won't endure sound doctrine. And I'd like to believe we teach sound doctrine here. Our generation is heaping up teachers like never before, and thanks to the internet, we're able to do that. And when so many of these types of people exist that hate the truth, a demand is created then for lying authors and lying ministers. And I'll tell you that if you want to be a false teacher, it's a very lucrative business in 2015. You make a lot of money writing books just saying what people want to read. You make a lot of money teaching things that people want to hear. They're, they will pay you well. I think it's a, I don't know if it's a cultural thing, but it seems that democracy has kind of influenced our approach to church. We got churches that are congregational churches. What that means is they're de democratic. They vote for the pastor that they want, and then they decide the kind of teaching that they want, and then they can shape that pastor into whatever they want him to be by basically um, threatening him with um, possible termination if he doesn't do it right. Um, they can vote him in. They can vote him out. You give a man a nice salary and a, a decent parsonage to live in, you can get that guy to do whatever you want him to do. Just threaten to fire him. And so now we've got a whole country full of churches that are getting what they want. Lies. They're paying good money and providing benefits to anybody who will lie to them. Make us feel good as we go to hell, okay? You stand behind the pulpit and you tell us things that are going to make us feel good about the way we're living our lives in spite of the fact that it's absolutely sinful and we're probably not even saved or we'll fire you. Jeremiah 5.31 says, The prophets prophesy lies, the priests rule by their own authority, and my people love it this way. God looks at it all and goes, Man, you love being lied to. And so just because people love what's being preached doesn't mean that what's being preached is true. Be wary of best-selling books on the Christian shelves. I mean, if the masses are loving it, I'm automatically skeptical. Be, be wary of what's coming down the pike from these TV evangelists. Something made them popular, and it probably wasn't the God-honoring truth. It's interesting when Paul says in verse 4 that they will turn their ears away from the truth and will be turned aside to fables. There are two different things happening there. They will turn and they will be turned. When Paul says they will turn aside from the truth, away from the truth, it indicates that their turning away from the truth was according to their own doing. They were, they were deliberate. They chose to turn away. But the second one, they will be turned is passive, meaning that the person was forced to turn aside to lies. They chose to turn away from the truth, but they couldn't help, they couldn't stop themselves from going opposite right into deceit. I guess you really have no choice to turn into lies because of 
the fact that you've turned away from the truth. There's nowhere else to turn. If you turn away from the truth, where else are you going to go? Even if you don't want to believe lies, even if you know it isn't true, you have nowhere else to turn. If you reject the light, you will become blind. If you turn away from God, you will be alone. If you reject heaven, you will go to hell. There's no other way, place to go. Even though you don't want to, even though you know it's a terrible place, you have chosen to go there by virtue of having made the decision to reject Christ. So it's an interesting play on words there in verse 4. They turn away, but then they're forced to turn into lies. And then Paul says in verse 5, but you... So Timothy's different. Timothy's not following the masses. He's not doing what the rest of the religious world in his day was doing. Timothy's different. And he says, Timothy, be watchful in all things. Keep a clear head. He says, endure afflictions. Let nothing stop you, including the threat of death. Which, Timothy's been alive long enough now to have seen some of his best teachers die, some of the greatest, godliest men that he has admired for two decades, they've been killed. The apostle, his mentor, the man that became to him like a father, is about to be executed. Timothy's going to get word of that sooner or later. And he knows that the spiritual climate in first century Israel is such that it's quite possible he himself may die. And Paul says, endure it. Endure afflictions, no matter what it costs you, man. Keep going. Preach the Bible. Do the work of an evangelist, he says. Bring in the unsaved. Keep bringing in the unsaved. I mean, Timothy's going to have to learn that in a, in a church style like that, where so many people are going to leave, you're going to also have to bring a lot of people in. Keep bringing people in. Otherwise, you're just going to keep preaching the offensive truth and pretty soon everybody's going to leave and since you brought nobody in, you're just preaching to an empty room. <laughs> right? Paul says, work to make sure that as many as people as possible will cycle through the hearing of God's truth. Do the work of an evangelist. Jesus had a two-fold ministry. He brought a lot of people in by the multitudes. He attracted people. He taught, he encouraged, his words were graceful. People had never heard such teaching. They were amazed, they marveled, they got free food and free health care and free education and Jesus was very benevolent and very, very gracious and giving and generous and all the rest. But then there was another side to his ministry where he just repelled people by the multitudes. And you can read that from beginning to end in John chapter 6. At the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is drawing upwards of 10, maybe 20,000 people to himself, and, and they're all just having a great time, big picnic in the grass. And by the end of that same chapter, everybody has left him. Almost his disciples. I mean, the multitudes came, and then the multitudes left. And Jesus says, you want to go too? Disciples, you guys want to? You can leave me. And so he had this ministry that drew people in, but it also pushed people away. I think that's a Jesus-style ministry. I think that's a God-honoring ministry, and I think that's just kind of the design of the Bible. Isn't there something attractive about the Bible? I mean, why is it that the world over, there's no other book that is so attractive? Some people are attracted to it for different reasons. Some love it, cherish it. Some people hate it. But there's an attractive thing about it. There's something significant about the Bible. And it pulls people in. It captures their attention. And then for some, it, it brings them there and it grows them into maturity. But others, it repels them. Bringing in and, and repelling. Jesus had that kind of a ministry. Paul is warning Timothy that he can expect that kind of a ministry. A lot of people are going to come in. A lot of people are going to go. But you stay on task. Be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Keep preaching. Fulfill your ministry. You remember last week we kind of did a Bible study about how Paul was telling Timothy to be like Paul. Right? To Paul saying, you, you've done a fine job under my tutelage. I've, I've been your mentor now for 20 years, and you have carefully followed my doctrine, my lifestyle, and all the rest. You've done a fine job of that. But now Paul is indicating that I'm not going to be around for very much longer. I'm about to die, and now I'm no longer telling you to be like me. Timothy, I'm telling you to be like Jesus. 
Last week it was all about Timothy being like Paul for he was doing a good job of carefully following his example, but now Paul's going to die and he knows it. And he won't be able to set the example any longer. And so Paul has given Timothy a new charge. Be like Jesus. Jesus preached the truth, Timothy. You preach the truth. And Jesus did it whether people liked it or not. You do it just like that, Timothy, in season and out of season. You make sure that you stay on it. And when Jesus preached, he not... He exposed their guilt and made them feel bad about it. They didn't only reprove and rebuke, he also exhorted, Timothy, you do that. Include all three elements in your preaching with all long suffering, just like Jesus did. He kept on with it. The masses turned away from him, and in doing so, they became spiritually delusional, going so far as to murder God. But Jesus remained watchful in all things. He knew what his mission was, and he kept on task. Even when his disciples fell asleep at the night of his betrayal, you know, that when his, Jesus remained watchful even when they were sleeping. He endured the afflictions of his enemies, and Timothy is going to have to endure the afflictions of his own. Be like Jesus, Paul says. And Jesus died to redeem the lost. So too, Timothy is going to, by the very necessity of the ministry, evangelize the lost. Bring to them, the ones without the message of Christ, the hope that's found in Christ, the forgiveness of sins that Jesus died to secure. Go out and tell them about this. And Jesus fulfilled his ministry, saying, on the cross it's finished, and Timothy is to fulfill his ministry. In other words, you don't get to start well and then just kind of like give up along the way. Carry on carry through, do it until you're dead or Jesus returns. And this is the call for every Christian in this room. I, I don't want us to go away from this thinking, well, that's for pastors. This is for pastors. This is for priests. But did you know that we are all priests in the household of God? And that you are called to be watchful in all things, and that you are called to endure afflictions, and we together are called to evangelize the lost, and we together are to fulfill our ministry, because ministry isn't something that's reserved for the guy with a suit and tie that stands on a stage, or a plaid shirt with long underwear, but you know, it's not reserved for us. Ministry is for you. Ministry is for we. What's our duty? primary responsibility above all things. Be truthful and honest. Preach the word, so to speak. Communicate effectively to everyone and anyone around you, whether they're saved or unsaved, the truth of God. That if they're saved, they may grow, and if they're not, they may get saved. This is a call to every one of us, and I don't want you to think that it's unique to pastors. Jesus has a mission for us. Jesus has, has goals for you to achieve. He has a calling for you to fulfill, and you can do that. How do you do that? Well, I think it's twofold. One is going along the lines of last week. I think you need to connect yourself to other Christians who are doing it better than you and learn from them. You need a mentor. You need to, you need to grow and learn and, and take advice and seek counsel and all those things. But you also need to be like Christ and seek to be like Jesus. What are you willing to do to be like Christ? How far are you willing to go? That's a good question. I, I, so I'm going to leave you with it. What are you willing to endure in order to be like Jesus? Let me give you a few of them. Are you willing to endure sound doctrine? Are you? Because there aren't many who will. Are you? Will you make it? Will you make it for the long haul? Will you survive not only the favorable seasons, but the unfavorable seasons? I mean, will you come to church only when you feel like repenting of sin and growing in Christ? Or will you come to church whether you want to or not, and you'll, you'll bear under the stinging words of the call to repentance from sin, and, and you will have the bravery to let go of that thing you cherish that God is trying to take away from you to save your life? Will you do that? Are you willing to endure sound doctrine? Are you willing to endure rejection? Are you willing to endure the mockery that comes along with being a Christian? Are you willing to endure the persecution that comes to all of those who choose to live godly in Christ Jesus? Are you willing to take the pain that is inherent to 
Christian discipleship? Are you willing to endure death to be like Jesus? There's a spiritual death. Are you willing to give up those hopes and dreams that you had kind of planned for yourself in order to find His calling and fulfill His mission? Or are you going to negate that so that you can keep living life the way you want? Are you going to crucify the, the flesh and the sinful nature and, and all of those things that accompany us from birth? Or are you going to keep living for the pleasures of this world? So there's a spiritual death that we must embrace if we want to be like Christ. But for Timothy, he was facing something even greater. He was staring down the barrel of a proverbial gun, having to decide whether or not he would, like his predecessor, the Apostle Paul, even endure physical torture and death to be like Christ. The question this morning, how far are you willing to go to be like Jesus? Are you living, living life, running around out there with no consideration to the things of God and the plan that He has for you, hoping that somehow, coincidentally, you'll become like Jesus along the way? Or are you dying to be like Jesus, sacrificing what needs to go, making the changes that need to be made, I think that what defines a Christian ultimately is that they have a desire to be like Jesus. I think that above and beyond all other things, that's, that's what makes a Christian a Christian. They truly want to be like Jesus, and they will do whatever it takes to become like Him. I pray for all, all of us here that that is the case, that, that, that even if there is only a glimmer right now just a glimmer of a desire to be like Jesus, that we would nurture that like a, like a, like a spark and, and bring that into its own flame and fan that so it might become a, a, a burning, unstoppable force in our lives to be like Jesus, even if there's only right now a glimmer. What are we willing to endure to become like Christ? When we're finished here, there will be a couple of guys up here on the stage. If anybody feels like they need prayer for anything, then you're welcome to come up here. Again, we'll shut these lights off so that there's a little more privacy and we'll just carry on about our business. Um, but if you want prayer, there will be a couple guys up here so you can pray. Father, we uh, close with a request asking that you would do the work in us to provide us with the desire to be like Christ. Admittedly, that's a very a foreign thing at the beginning of a person's walk with God. Uh, no one is born wanting to be like Jesus, and a lot of people don't even know what Jesus was like. Only the Holy Spirit can give us a desire like that. And even us, as some of us as Christians, we've been walking with God for a while, and, and we do love this, and yet we're prone to seasonal changes within our own heart, and sometimes we're emphatic about it, and enthusiastic and excited about growing and doing whatever we need to do for Jesus, but then it's a different story when we wake up tomorrow morning. It's a new season altogether. The, way, the weather changes so quickly. We're like Thomas and the gang when they said, let's go to Jerusalem and die with Jesus. I will. We're like Peter who says, I'll, I'll go with you to the end even if it means dying. And then within hours we're like, well, I don't know who that even is. I, I don't know why I said that. I must have had some bad mayonnaise last night. I, it was just a dream maybe. 
And so, Father, we, we pray that you would do that work in us that only you can do. And, and I, I want to go beyond um, just this room and ask that you would be doing that in the lives of people that we are yet to encounter so that you would make our um, ministry fruitful, that, that our co-workers would begin to feel this desire to be like Christ. Maybe they don't even know what it is. They couldn't put their finger on it. They, it's so unfamiliar to them. But that we might be used by you to come along and explain it so that they know what it is and can pursue it. I pray that you would make us fruitful in this community and help us to bring the truth to the world, that um, we might see some conversions, that we would do the work of evangelism. I, I pray that we would be ready to endure any hostility or pushback that we get for, for doing such a thing in this community. I pray that we'd be guarded and be watchful, that we don't fall into sin as we go, but we would stay strong and, and, and God, that we would just serve you well and we pray that you would continue to work in our lives and in the midst of this church to do a great work in the generation in which we live that when we die we have something to show for the life you gave us. And we love you, Lord. Thank you for the time we've had. Amen. there's one thing that's missing in the lives of many Christians, it's doing something. But there's a lot of Christians out there who are living their life as a Christian with nothing to really do with it. What sets our church apart from many others, not all, but many, is that we will give you something to do with your Christianity.